I said, empty your mind. Be formless, shapeless, like water. Now you put water into a cup, it becomes the cup. You put water into a bottle, it becomes the bottle. You put it in a teapot, it becomes the teapot. Now water can flow or it can crash. Be water, my friend. All right, guys. Hey, welcome back to another episode uh, of the Condo Channel. So today, I am thrilled to have Don as our guest. Uh, Don's story is short of nothing of exciting. He's a former Marine Raider uh, who transitioned to the reserves in the fourth uh, reconnaissance after active duty. Since retiring from the military, he's co-founded Deep End Fitness, where he's making a splash, no pun intended, by creating a positive shift in water confidence um, and performance through team building games and also workouts. So Don and his team have even created an underwater torpedo league. Um, so that's something we're going to dive into as well. So just super honored to have Don on the show today and can't, you know, can't wait to learn more about his incredible journey. So, hey, Don, man, appreciate you coming on board, man. I know it was, it was a long time coming, but I appreciate you coming on board. Yeah, I appreciate you being patient and uh, I'm super stoked to be on the show. Yes, sir. All right, man. I always like to start with just kind of a couple, a couple of uh, little warmer questions. So I got four for you and always just kind of cool to see how people respond and what their outlook on this. So the first one, man, is going to be, what is the happiest moment in your life, and why was that moment special to you? Um, man, um, I would say till this day, I can always think back when you know people ask me that question. Sometimes it was coming back from uh, my first deployment from Iraq. You know, I was eighteen at the time coming back. Oh no, I just I just turned nineteen at the time. But you know, going from uh, the U.S. and of course going through like boot camp and all that stuff was uh, you know its own struggles and its own battles. But going overseas into a completely different environment. Um, and being living in the desert and, and having no communications back home, eating like, you know, MREs and horrible food and then coming back to the U.S. It just made me appreciate the U.S. so much. And just I was so happy. Like when I got on the ground, when we got off that plane, I like kissed the floor. I was like, Fool, <laughs> we are home, baby. Like we we've done it. We made it back from, you know, from combat or whatever it is. And it came back and. I had my girlfriend at the time, but she was on the parade deck when we were there and everything. So that was probably one of the happiest times of my life and just uh, the most grateful time as well to, you know, go from like a, a third world country that's from, from Iraq. So coming back to the U.S. was like, man, we live in such an amazing country, an amazing place. And um, hopefully we keep that way. Yeah, 100%. Man. I, I, uh, being in service, uh, going out of tra training exercise and just kind of being away for a little bit, I understand completely, you know, after just eating MREs and, you know, having like a sleep and then you come over here and, uh, you're just like, like I can go to the, I can go wherever I want. I have this, this luxury. Yeah, so yeah, I can completely. Yeah. Huh? The freedom alone of to do like, exactly. Go to the store, you know, and, or anything. So, yeah, one of the best times. Exactly, man. Next one's going to be, what do you miss the most from your time in the Marine Corps? Uh, the boys, for sure. The crew, the men, um, the, the cool stuff, you know, shooting, jumping on planes, helicopter rides, cruising on boats. Yeah, that's like very, that's probably like 25% of the job. You know, the rest of it's like the, the planning the, and all the bureaucracy and all that stuff. So, yeah, but um, getting to spend time with the guys is, is awesome as well. That's what I miss most. Uh, okay. Next one is, what is the meaning of life uh, for you? Yeah, so transitioning outside now, out of the military, that's always been a question, especially in the first few years. Like, what's my purpose now? Like, what am I doing? Because in the military, it's so easy to have. You know, like, hey, all right, we're going to go on a mission. This is the next deployment. This is the mission on deployment. So you always had a sense of purpose and sense of belonging, too, to like a, you know, an organization that you help build and be a part of. Um, but now it's like, um, how can I replicate some of the things I've learned in the military or creating that culture that I learned in the military, especially in the soft community and replicate that outside. So our mission now, like to really think about it besides the, the mission that you stated earlier for deep and fitness is kind of really just empower and ignite like a warrior class of people is what we like to call it. Right. And try to put people through experiences that will help them grow and kind of face the discomfort and then use those skills that they've learned in that discomfort to help them navigate other problems in life. And when we were in the military, you know, being on a special operations team and having that environment of like just top performing dudes and what they do 
and being in that environment of everybody trying to collaborate, help each other out because you can't do it alone, right? You know, it's always a team environment and they always teach that, but to kind of learn and foster that and now we kind of replicate that outside in the civilian world in whatever capacity we can, right? Of course, we don't have that same culture um, and as well as the freedom is different, right? And you're not forced through to go through like so much adversity together, but we can recreate that um, in a limited capacity outside here in the civilian world as well and how people kind of navigate that. Got it. And this last one can kind of be tricky. I've, I've asked this uh, basically on every single, for, for the uh, podcast I have, you know, warmer pleasures or not. So yeah. you got to take time to think about it, no worries. But um, if you had to write a book about yourself, what would it be called and what would it be about? Man, if I were to write a book about my time in the military, it would be anonymous, number one. Um, so they wouldn't know it was me in my, in my face and stuff like that. But some of the experiences that you go through in the military, like, are unspeakable of, you know, in certain ways. But drawing that real emotion out, drawing the real um, kind of feelings and being transparent about that would be amazing. But sometimes you can't put that all into a book, especially um, if you have, you know, if you're trying to still keep like that self image or that personal brand to do other things. So. We'll just leave it at that. But the title would be, I don't know. I got to think about that one. But something. Because, <laughs> like, you know, like in the culture, it's like there, there could be cr some criminals that were in the military that were like leaving their past life and like just getting away with things. I don't know what the best title, like, don't get caught or some, so, I don't know, something like that. But, you know, there's a lot of things that go on that people don't know about in the military. But that would be cool to tell some of those stories. I think anonymous might be, might just have to be your, your, uh, I don't might have to be it, man. <laughs> now people are going to be asking for your book, man. And, and I just had a curiosity since we're, we're talking about that. Do you ever, do you ever see yourself writing a book? Like in the future? We, uh, so Prime, my business partner and I, we were in the military together and all that stuff, but, um, and we have the company now together. We wrote like a, a guidebook. It's called Free Your Mind. Um, so like in 2020, when COVID happened, like our company shut down and we were like trying to figure everything out and we wrote, like this manual based off, off of our training principles of free, which is focus, relaxation, economy, emotion, efficient breathing. We kind of wrote a guidebook and started passing around the community and ended up getting hands of a publisher. Um, so now that book's published, you can buy it on Amazon, Barnes and Nobles and stuff like that. Um, it's called Free Your Mind, Free Your Mind Guidebook. So yeah, we wrote that book, but a personal story, never thought about it. Probably never will. I got you, man. Unless it's this, right, so this thing that you're talking yeah, about. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, listen. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be a good one, man. <laughs> All right. So just kind of now getting into, you know, chronological order of things. Well, you know, of course, start with growing up. So just starting with the basics, you know, just kind of tell us, you know, uh, where you were born, uh, when and where you were born and, you know, how many siblings, if, if you had any siblings growing up. Yeah. Um, cool. So uh, I'm Vietnamese, like born and raised Vietnamese. Uh, but my parents were, uh, came over here in 1975. So, um, met each other in like California and then uh, I was born and raised in, in Long Beach, uh, California. And I'm actually in Long Beach right now. We have, we have a townhouse here. Um, but um, yeah. And then I went to Wilson high school. I uh, had two sisters, one older, one younger. My older sister is a year and a half older than me. And my younger sister is a year younger than me. Um, my older sister lives in LA now. And my younger sister lives in San Francisco. So we're still pretty tight and pretty close. So good to see each other often. Um, yeah, and then I went to Wilson High School uh, and then joined the military right after I graduated um, high school. So like I said, it. yeah, and I was just kind of just kind of doing research when not on you just trying to, you know, read more about you kind of get in a little bit more about your life. Um, more specific, like what, what uh, it's called the Veterans Project. Um, it was like a little blog post. Um, and I was kind of reading a little bit about it. But in terms of, you know, growing up, you know, you were it was stating that. You had a very traditional, or you were stating that you had a very traditional uh, Vietnamese family with strict, with strict guidance. In what ways, like, were they kind of being strict with mm -hmm. you and your siblings? So, I mean, my parents didn't know shit about raising kids in, in the U.S. or in America, right? So they kind of reverted back to what they knew, how they were raised, of course, uh, in Vietnam, which is like super Catholic family, uh, going to church every Sunday, be home by 8 p.m., you know, sports or whatever it is. A matter of having team outings after that, can't go. You got to be home, um, pray before we eat, pray at night, pray in the morning. Uh, so just kind of keeping it really traditional and no fault on their own whatsoever. I love my parents. Um, but, you know, just that's what they knew. So um, 
of course, in the U.S., it's a completely different environment than it is raising family in Vietnam. So um, there's a lot of like cultural clashing and like a lot of me trying to break out of that shell and like do what I thought was cool things at the time outside of like their their blessings, pretty much. Yeah. Um, but yeah. And I read, uh, I seen your your father was a naval officer for, and uh, correct me if I'm wrong, the South Vietnamese Navy. Yeah. Did he ever uh, share stories or experiences with you about that? Uh, very limited. Like when he was, uh, so yeah, so he was, served in the South Vietnamese Navy like a riverine uh, boat captain. Um, and uh, he actually went to OCS in Rhode Island. So they did like an exchange program during the Vietnam War brought a bunch of Vietnamese dudes over and then trained them up over here and then brought them back over to Vietnam to, to fight the war. But, um, yeah, only when he was, like, hammered or when he was with his other friend. <laughs> like, I heard, like, snippets of, like, the stories and, and shit like that. But some of it was gnarly, dude. Like, one time, I remember he was, um, like, the lieutenant. He was a lieutenant at the time. It was, like, sat on the very top. So it's, like, maybe the third story up, you know, of, like, these small towers on top of these boats. So that's, like, an outlook kind of pose. And his whole boat got shot up, and he was the only one that survived. Like two rounds, like hit the back of his helmet, and one bounced off the like post or something, hit his head, and, and actually knocked him out. And when he woke up, like his entire boat was dead. You know, like that shit's crazy to even think about or hear. He got shot through the calf and then through the ass as well, or through one of his ass cheek. Um, survived that, of course. But, oh wow! So crazy stories, and just like talking about that, like what people think of warfare is now like in modern day is, is of course it's so crazy gruesome and all that stuff like that but like relating back to the vietnam war that shit was wild crazy and like and, what people were going through and like even the u.s troops fighting these north american soldiers or the commies over there like with like the punji pits and all that stuff and then even going back you know world war ii is really glorified because it was such a massive kind of battle but like think about like what they went through in those times and it's just crazy to think about that like even now like the warriors that we have now not saying to discredit them whatsoever just saying like the experiences back then were a lot could be a lot crazier in the masses uh to what people have seen in like modern day war okay yeah it's um it's um it's crazy because i I, uh this is years ago man but i remember talking to my dad and I think he knew somebody who was in the uh, in that war, and he was telling me how, if I if I re- if I recollect if I recall correctly, like basically like he he was like by himself for some reason, but he was hidden, and um, some like some of um, the Korean uh, some of the war fighters were like raping a woman, and he was like he couldn't do anything because like he was like him and his men were like outnumbered. And he just had to sit there and watch, but luckily, like, or watch or hear or, or whatever the case, and um, he couldn't do anything about it. And I just remember thinking, and like, luckily they didn't find him. You know, there would have been heavy contact, and you know, who knows what would happen. But just hearing that, I'm like, dude, it's like, like, imagine like you seeing someone get raped, but you can't, you literally cannot do anything because you're just like, you just you're helpless. You're out, man. You're, yeah. you know, it's just, uh, it's crazy. So yeah. yeah. <laughs> Unfortunately, think about. happen now all the time, you know, yeah, like sexual assault and stuff like that, especially in other countries and things like that, where they don't have such rules and things like that. So it's kind of crazy. Yeah. And so you attended a, uh, a private Catholic school from first to eighth grade. Like, yeah. from what I know, this is like, you know, you were small, but like from what you can remember, how yeah. is it being going to like a private Catholic school? Yeah. So I think we, uh, each, class had a different day that they went to mass you know so we went to mass like three times a week kind of thing um sunday so like twice with school and then once with um uh, you know your parents or whatever on, on sundays um like had a very small class i think it was like 30 ish people and some people rotated in and out but kept the same kind of crew i don't really talk to much of them right now uh anymore but some of them actually i, I keep like lightly in touch with um from here to there but yeah Nothing too crazy to hear about, but, you know, just growing up in that kind of sheltered uh, environment um, kind of made me lash out a little bit more when I was in high school. Yeah. yeah. So why, why did your parents send you from a private school to a public school? 
Yeah, so I went to, I was in kindergarten uh, in like a public school in Long Beach and I didn't get along with the kids and like we were, you know, getting in fights and, you know, pushing each other off the monkey bars and stuff like that and I was getting in trouble like for fighting other kids and, and things like that. So they just thought it wasn't a good environment for me. So then they moved me over to, to private school. Okay. And yeah. once you get to public, uh, like um, public school, it was a uh, Wilson, Wilson, you said Wilson High School? Yeah, Wilson High School. Once you get to Wilson High School, like like you're like you're mentioning, you know, you find yourself in trouble. Um, you were actually doing good up until junior year. You you were taking like I believe AP classes, like you were doing good. And yeah. then like I think senior yeah. years is when things kind of started falling off. So I guess my question in a sense was, yeah. what was this crowd you started hanging out with, and what started that started getting you in trouble? I think it was like the end of uh, sophomore year, or like sophomore year ish, and things like that. That the grades started to turn around, but um okay. yeah just you know groups of friends in long beach and stuff like that and and meeting the wrong people and, and getting caught up in way too many things and trying to be cool and uh yeah just getting surrounded with like um you know drugs and gangs and stealing cars and clothes and stuff like that so just all the mischief stuff that you know that you could think of when you're younger as a kid so like when you're like stealing like clothes and rob you know just robbing us or like a fact do you, you did you ever have a moment where you're like man like this isn't me like especially with the kind of parents you had like maybe thinking like man what would my parents think of this right now like did you ever have that moment or moments like that i mean i would say maybe the first few times i felt guilty doing it yeah uh but after that i was like man this is like the ultimate adrenaline rush kind of thing and it kind of became addictive in a certain way at a young young age right because like my parents didn't grow up with money, right? So, like, even putting us in private school was, like, a struggle for them. And we were, like, when we were younger, we were, you know, living in a house with, like, three other families, you know, kind of situation. So, um, when I had started stealing clothes, I, we started slanging it and, and selling it. So, that was, like, my first real intro to money and, like, being able financial freedom in whatever capacity that could be in high school, right? And the ability to, to buy things I wanted to do, to take girls on dates or go to the movies on my own and, you know, and all that stuff. And so that would, became addicted to that kind of lifestyle and that freedom that I was having that wanted to continue that and fit in and be cool. And, and then it, it kind of got me into like way deeper than I was ready for, right? Because I went from like clothes to like drugs to cars and, and all that stuff. So it just put me in a really bad kind of place. And that's why I ended up joining the military to kind of get away from that. Got you. Now, not going into, like, when you do join the Marine Corps, um, what was the turning point that led you, that did, that led you to the Marine Corps? Yeah, so, man, I think we were out in uh, Ontario Bells, um, California, and there's this, you know, like, outdoor kind of outlet mall kind of thing, and <laughs> I think we, like, stole some DVDs from uh, Virgin Mobile, like, a store back in the day that you could, you know, buy DVDs, you know, CDs and all that music and stuff yeah. like that. I ended up getting caught by the mall security and they called the cops on me uh, and then brought me to like the city station or whatever that is. And I am trying to call my mom to come pick me up. And at, at that point, you know, I've been, uh, you know, a little rascal for a few years already. So my mom was like, I'm done, dude. I'm not coming to pick you up anymore. You can stay there. And I talked to her about it now and she was like, yeah, I was just going to leave you there for a night just for you to learn your lesson. But for me, I thought that was the end of the world, you know, kind of thing. Um, and I think I was 16 or 17 at the time, 16 probably. And then um, I remember getting a card from my recruiter, uh, Sergeant Powell, you know, um, just like a random thing that I don't even know why I had it. But it was in my wallet. So I ended up calling him and he came and picked me up out of jail, you know, and uh, took care of the cops and everything. So that I was joining the military. So like literally no bail, no anything and, and just brought me out of there. And they said they were going to take care of me. So when I saw that, I kind of saw the brotherhood of like what the Marines could be. And like it forecasted uh, kind of my career and, and learning that aspect of it. And I kind of delivered that brotherhood to other Marines and stuff like that as well. So that's what, what kind of decided was the deciding factor for me to join. One of the deciding factors why I joined the Marines. And did any other branches like try to come at you, like persuade you to look into their branch or, you know, the options that they had, or you were just like so honed in on the Marine Corps? Uh, I mean, I explored the Navy, too, because, like, back then, like, the only thing you knew as a kid was, like, the only special operations or, like, the super cool guy stuff was, like, Navy SEALs, you know, kind of mm -hmm. thing. And uh, my parents at the time when I was joining, they, they didn't want me to do any of that. 
was stuck. Yeah, they want me to open, open contract and figure that out, like what I wanted to do. Um, and like, just get a way to discipline myself and then go to school afterwards. Right. Um, so yeah, just a different environment, but yeah. But okay. Those are the ones you so want. what, uh, what MOS did you end up choosing and what was it about that, that, yeah. that MOS that gravitated you towards that? Yeah, so I went in uh, 03 open contract, which is infantry open contract, and then uh, went to boot camp and SOI. Then uh, it was like a time to decide what you wanted to be, like either a mortarman, machine gunner, assault man, tow gunner. I don't think they have tow gunners anymore. But um, yeah, just like uh, I was Asian and they thought it was going to be because of the <laughs> Yeah. So fast forward to boot camp, you know, <laughs> with, brother, with brotherhood being something that you were seeking, was that something you got a deep sense for? And also, you know, with the challenge that the Marine uh, Marine boot camp offers, you know, one of the toughest boot camps, if not the toughest boot camps in the U.S. military, um, did you get tested mentally and physically like you wanted to as well? Yeah, for sure. I mean, at a young age, you know, you're very impressionable to the things that happen around you and like some dude yelling and spitting in your face and like, you know, and if you're not listening to him, then everyone else suffers. That was like a thing for me. Like there's you know consequences for the things that you're doing that's gonna affect other people not just yourself um so that was kind of the first intro but like yeah everybody every every step of the way in the military has its own challenges especially of where i was at in the maturity level to um knowledge and like understanding and experiences and every single t- step of the way was definitely hard um for me during those points right some people say boot camp's easy now looking back at it, it was like yeah that was nothing you know but for me at the time it was like kind of difficult thing to kind of face and, and deal with and, and kind of push okay yeah and then the, the brotherhood aspect too was that something that you got a deep sense for and like in boot camp yeah i mean you develop some friends at boot camp i actually don't know any of them or remember any of their names in boot camp but soi a little bit for sure so school of infantry is what you go to next um but it isn't really until you like you get to your unit um and i went to first battalion force marines which even through those shared struggles because like each situations with these guys right and sometimes you lose somebody you know that builds a lot of bond if you know you shared that experience or you might have saved someone's life or they might have saved your life or you know vice versa and that connection is like you can't break that and i still talk to those guys at one four all the time um and you yeah. know every time as well and um so after boot camp like you said you report to sli school of infantry uh, school of infantry yeah um was it a lot was it a lot of great training and, and preparation for you to answer when you when you went to first battalion fourth marines like did it prepare you well um i mean they teach you the basics right so learn how to patrol learn how to read a map to a certain degree learn how to land navigate uh, just like basic small unit tactics learn how to use a radio so all that stuff of course it's extremely important uh and building upon those to, when you get to the unit um to do a lot of stuff but when you get to the unit like there's a lot of changes on how they teach things and the equipment might be new, might be have different weapons and kind of thing. So yeah, it, it definitely gives you a basic understanding of what you need to prepare for. Uh, but a lot of things are different. So you, I guess the point is you have to be able to adapt and adjust uh, and learn new things on, on the fly and quickly, right? Because sometimes you don't have the opportunity to actually kind of dive into that. Yeah. So after SOI, you, you, you check into 1st Battalion uh fourth marines from what you kind of from what you can kind of remember how was that like whole check-in process for you yeah um so we graduated soi in like december camp was like in july you know or june or something like that anyways but graduated so um my unit was already in the field like it it barely issued me any gear it was like a range called range 130 so it's like a big ass mountain town um where they do like uh urban terrain uh and like city kind of scenarios of, of training um and then my unit was already there and that was like the day that our battalion commander came out and, and told us that we were going to iraq so it was like a rude awakening right when i got to one four which is pretty crazy you know and considering you like you had no gear like you couldn't like participate really did you have that like left out and like almost like were really upset that you weren't able to participate like you like you wanted to I was just scared, bro, to be honest with you. Like, I didn't really think about anything else. Like, going into a brand new environment with, like, you know, because in boot camp and SOI, like, you're like, you know, there's guys that are in your unit that have been in war and all that shit. You got to 
careful how you wake them up and, and all that stuff. And that was a reality. Like when I got there, you know, all that, all I did at the time, like the, those two days were like stand fire watch at night for most of the night, you know, and they let me sleep in the day when everyone else was training uh, kind of situation. But um, yeah, it was just, I, the fear of uncertainty was like a, a real thing. That was like the only thing. Um, but feeling left out, I really didn't care at that point. I was like, I have no idea what's going on. We're about to go out of Iraq in like two months or three months or whatever that is. Like, I was just like scared. So I didn't really process anything else much more than like, what the fuck is going on here? You know, like, how do, like <laughs> why, am I, am I in the right place right now, dude? Yeah. yeah. And then, uh, before you, before you go to Iraq, you do a three month workup. Um, so s- some of the viewers may not be familiar with what a workup is and what exactly goes into into a workup uh, to ensure you're ready for for deployment. So can you kind of describe like what what happens during those three months? Yeah. So in the infantry at the time, I think you do some like own small unit training. And I didn't get to go through most of this, right? Because we got a call earlier or whatever it is. But you do some small unit training with your platoon itself. And then you do a company level exercises and do some company level stuff. And I was with the weapons company, right? So typically traditional weapons companies are uh, I think two cap platoons, one weapon or one eighty one platoon, which is the mortar platoon, um, and then maybe a tow or something, machine gun school. I don't know exactly how it's broken up anymore. But for us, we were going to Iraq, and uh, we needed mortars in each platoon, right? So we they formed what they call map platoons, so mobile assault platoons. So um, I think twelve trucks with you know four or five dudes in each truck and then you had machine gunners there you had infantrymen in there and you had watermen in there you had some tow gunners and assault men and, and all that stuff within that truck to be ready for whatever that mission that we were supposed to go on um at the time yeah where was go- where was he going with this <laughs> no i was just basically like what goes into like oh yeah the, a work the, the, so you do some company training and then you'll do uh the battalion kind of um uh, finex or final exercise where they qualify you <clears throat> to go on deployment and ours was uh at, in 29 palms and i think it was called mojave x or something mojave viper or yeah mojave viper at the time so you do like three weeks in the desert getting ready to go over to iraq or afghanistan dude there's a bunch of stuff out there so uh that was our workup and we, we pretty much had some company training some battalion training and then we were out the door overseas yeah yeah and uh i know you experienced some like hazing um and at one point you know even kind of resort to sleeping in your car kind of like walk us through like your mental and how that was affecting you mentally and maybe even emotionally yeah so i mean like when you're on the new guy on any team or anything like that um you know you got to go through certain things to kind of earn your place but there's also times where you know it can go too far and they're just doing it to have fun or they're just doing it to belittle you or degrade you and like uh in the military experience like you know a certain level of racism is 100 percent real and and not because it's like they choose to be racist but sometimes it's because they don't know or they haven't experienced other races until they join right and it's easy for you to click up with like different groups of people that you align with or that you're you know that are your people kind of thing and there's a very small asian community in the military you know um especially in the infantry and especially even more in like special operations kind of environment. But um, yeah, but the hazing situation, I mean, like these guys are just thinking they were having fun, but you know, everyone's coming back from war ready and you know, they, they're dealing with their own issues and they can take that out on you. And yeah, I mean, what, what were you trying to go through? What kind of point were you trying to get with this? But... No, I just, it's just, it's just interesting um, to see like the mental aspect of it um how someone feels because everybody reacts differently you know what i mean like someone could get haze and one person might seek to drugs another person might seek to suicide like because especially in the military you're locked in like you can't just it's not like here like in the states where you're like when like people are treating me indifferent yada yada yada, i could just quit you have to stay there so it's kind of interesting to see like your like how people were reacting in that moment and like kind of just how they push through it basically well, for me, I was trying to understand like what their motivations were, like or why they were doing yeah. that. And then if, if if there was an opportunity to remove myself from that worst time or that worst situation, that would be the move, right? So like, yeah, Ken Pendleton is like 50, 55, 60 miles away from where I grew up. So literally, 
you know, sometimes I would just, after work was done and, you know, liberal was called or liberty was called, like, I was out the door, I'm out of there. Or, like, I would go sleep in my friends, because we were living in squad bays at the time, so, like, a bay with, like, 30-something dudes, you know, like, our beds wall walkers and all that bullshit so that was not the best place to be because you had to deal with these guys 24 7 you couldn't remove yourself from this situation so i had some friends in other units that had rooms that maybe had a spare bed i would go sleep in there with them you know and then come back early in the morning for you know morning formation or whatever that is or or we tried home or you know whatever situation i had to do to get myself away from that especially when these guys are drinking at night then it turned into a worse situation and then you know, you don't want to be caught around that. So for me, it was like, all right, is this the best place for me to be right now? Nah, let's move on, figure out another way to deal with this when they're first. Yeah, and I know it's it's tough. You know what I mean? It can, it can be extremely tough, especially like you said, when people are coming back from war and they're trying to accustom back to just this whole reality compared to what they what they were kind of going through over there. Yeah. Um, you know what I mean? But yeah, I just, I just kind of like to, like I said, bring stuff up like that to see, you know, people's emotions and, you know, kind of talk about it. And especially in the military, I know that's like a big thing that they talk about nowadays with hazing, what's, what's good hazing, what's bad hazing. Should there even be hazing in the military? You know, cause some people like they take it really far and then they just kind of, you know, bad things just kind of happen or not. But, um, anyways, yeah, I was just, just wanted to. Okay. And in the military, man, like, like if you, sometimes if you don't learn your lessons, like people will die right? Your friends mm-hmm. and all that stuff. So there has to be a way to discipline or teach people how to do things or make them understand that in a way that is more receptive or like they'll remember that for sure. That is not maybe seen as okay in like the civilian world, you know? So there, of course, there's a balance, right? But if you're doing it just to, you know, to make yourself feel better and to hurt someone else, whether that be emotionally or, you know, physically or whatever that is then that's hazing but if you're doing it to teach them a lesson and you know you're not doing it for out of ego and you're doing it to hey maybe this can save your life or someone else's life one day maybe there's a way to kind of navigate that and and kind of thread that needle yeah yeah um 100 percent, i agree with that when you kind of know the why be the the why behind something it makes things a lot a lot better and it's in uh those aspects uh for sure but yeah. kind of going back into uh you know uh more, being a mortar man and whatnot um as a mortar man like well, what are you responsible for and during your tenure as a mortar man uh did you find yourself in a lot of leadership roles yeah so when i was in one four in iraq we probably shot my first deployment we probably shot maybe like 20 30 rounds or something like that you know whether it be a weapons cachet we're trying to hit or we're, get, we're getting mortar fire ourselves and we're trying to find these guys back and shoot the mortars back at them, right? But very limited. Second deployment, I was in Fallujah in the middle of the city and we can't just, and this was 2008, right? Um, so we can't just drop mortars in the city because there's people living, moved back into the cities and living in it, right? And I was a little like, at OP Burgess, like right in the middle of the city. So we had mortar positions set up that never would shoot that many mortars there. Maybe shot a few loom rounds throughout that um, deployment. But when I went to Afghanistan, you know, we were using mortars to shoot people back. And we were dropping 120s instead of 81s or 60s that we were used to. So, like, 120s are probably bigger than my head kind of in diameter. Um, and shooting those rounds, whether it be uh, bad guys that we see and we can fly drones over and like, see where they're coming or digging in IDs or whatever that is, and we would shoot them. Um, yeah. And then... I was in amateur as well as my job as uh, one of the leadership positions that I held was FTC chief, which we talked about a little bit earlier, but the fire direction control center. So we get a call in from whatever infantry unit or whoever needs fire support. <clears throat> they give us some coordinates. Uh, we put that coordinates, throw it into the sites of the, or I'll translate those coordinates and then drop into the sites of the gun line and they'll shoot those rounds out there. Uh, but yeah, besides that, you know, just typical leadership, infantry, regular stuff. So. Got it. And while you're while you're deployed to like you know Iraq or Fallujah, kind of what is like y'all's mission at tent while y'all while y'all are deployed there? Um, if that makes sense. Yeah, I mean, typical would be to win the hearts and minds of the people that you were there in the villages or the town or the cities or whatever that you're at to you know gain their respect to be able to help them navigate their security issue. 
So if there was a major security issue that there was like a known, um, you know, ID creator or a financier for the terrorist cell or whatever that is, we would help them try to find, identify, and um, take those people out. So very similar things in special operations, but just a way more precise way, way more tools to collect the information, um, way more money to run operations and, and things like that. So completely two different scales, but very similar mission to in a certain way of, of doing that. And kind of going back to like the mental aspect of things, like what kind of kept you going mentally during your having, um, mentally, what kept you going during deployment, you know, when you're having to deal with all sorts of, all sorts of stuff and even working in crazy weather conditions, like a hundred plus, you know, degrees. So just kind of, you know, walks through that mentality wise. Yeah. I mean, like you, you have your mission, right? So no one really gives a fuck if you're, or sorry, some of my language, but no one really cares yeah, about second. <clears throat> like the struggles or the discomfort you're feeling, right? We just need to make sure that we get the mission done. So um, for me, it was kind of instilled into to me in a certain way as well. Like, hey, all right, let's just stick to it, push through it, and let's get it done. Especially when you're overseas, like, you know that somebody might shoot you, and if you don't do it correctly or whatever that is, you're trying to follow, like, cross all your T's, dodge your I's kind of situation. So no matter what weather it is, rain, you know, extreme heat or whatever that is, like, you just continue to push on. And, um, yeah, that's pretty much it, man, for for the weather side. Okay. Yeah, was, that plays. Is there deep. anything you recall? I'll go to Azar. Go ahead. No, no, I was just saying, like, is there anything you recall looking back from time in Iraq or in Fallujah during your deployment? Were you, like, an experience where you endured the suck, you know, quote, unquote, and look back on it as a great experience for you? Yeah, of course, man. Like, uh, that's where you really learn, like, that you can be independent to a certain degree. You know, like, our Iraq, our first deployment, like, we had one sat phone that we called, we was able to call home for a five-minute call every two weeks. You know, sometimes it worked, sometimes it didn't. So, and, like, just being off the grid, being independent, learning that, and then being, like, in a completely different environment and making yourself, you know, adapt to that situation, grow from it, find the good in it. You know, especially from like your own self growth kind of perspective, um, that was huge from it. But yeah, so many good memories, so many bad memories uh, over there as well. Um, but yeah, can you pinpoint like a specific one though, and kind of like walk us through that that moment and what you were feeling, what was happening for the bad moments? Yeah, um, like in terms of like pinpointing a specific uh, moment. Uh, where you were enduring the suck, like just like a like an example, like uh, if you're rucking through uh, crazy, you're on a ruck march and you're rucking through crazy terrain, and you're thinking like, man, like, uh, you're like, I, I, how much farther can I go? And then once you complete it, looking looking back, you're like, dang, like I didn't think, I I didn't realize how much farther I could push myself. So just kind of, I, I'm hoping that kind of makes sense, the example I'm giving, but that's yeah. kind of like what yeah. I'm trying to portray. Yeah, it does. And like in like the overseas situation, there wasn't a point in the overseas where like, oh shit, you know, like my body can't take this anymore. It was more like, oh shit, we're getting fucking shot at right now. You know, like, hey, how do I maneuver around this? But it wasn't <clears throat> where like, oh, I can't endure this anymore. It was like, hey, we need to get out of here. Or like, hey, we need to push the fight or whatever that is but like in training situations that was like more of like all right man i don't know how much further i can go my body is breaking down i haven't had sleep and all that stuff and that was more of the reality during training i mean there's definitely been actually in afghanistan we had one gunfight where we're trying to get this helicopter back in that crash marine helicopter crash outside it was like a two and a half day gunfight and we we're out the whole time fighting with these guys yeah so at that point but we were shooting from a static position moving around um, back and forth, and it wasn't. We had a lot of air support come in, so we didn't need to push the line too far forward because there's no reason for us to risk our lives to go over there just to kill those bad guys when we can call in high Mars, which is like artillery kind of style, um, or air support, you know. Um, but just staying over there. But training, no, I kind of overall, um, how would you rate your, your experience at uh, first battalion, fourth Marines? Oh, dude, it was an awesome time. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> I guess the difference between that and special operations kind of side is, like, 
the level of training, the level of professionalism from each guy and how much they want to put in, um, the mission set uh, and all that, but like the experiences of like learning, growing and where I was at that time where that I was, how old I was and the level of experience I was, it was a perfect learning experience for me and, and kind of growing through that. So yeah, wouldn't take it back for anything. Met some amazing people, amazing dudes and explored what the, you know, what the other country has to offer besides LA where I grew up. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, for, for someone wanting to do, or I was looking into doing like infantry in the Marines, is that something that you would recommend them, uh, someone to choose, choose infantry? I would say, what are your reasons? I would ask, what are the reasons? Or like, what's their why? Like, why do they want to join the infantry? Or why not? Don't they want to join? But like, I would find out more information. But um, if you want like adventure and experience and, you know, you're, because dude, in the infantry, it's, it's kind of shitty in a way that you got to go to the field all the time. You don't always get the best food. Yeah. You know, you don't always get gym time, which is a huge thing. Look for you join the military and you get slim yeah. or the Marines, you get jacked and swole. But like, sometimes you don't even have time to work out whatsoever. You know, you're in the field Monday through Sunday, you get a day off and you're back, you know, training again. So, um, you know, all this training doesn't mean that you're like lifting weights and doing all that stuff. You're like, you're literally walking for days and hours kind of thing. So, I would figure out why they want to, you know, what they want to explore, what they want to do in the future, right? Because maybe there's going to be something after. Um, so figure out what their motivations are and then kind of guide them in that direction. If they want to be a computer guy, then don't join the infantry. You know, I yeah. wanted that adventure, that blowing gun, blowing shit out, shooting guns and all that stuff before you went into that route. Then I would yeah. explore that. Yeah, it's a, uh, it's a tough one, man. Like I, uh, I did infantry in the guard and, uh, Hey, like you said, it's a crazy, it's a crazy lifestyle. It, it's a, I don't know, I don't even know how to explain. It. It's hard to put into words. Like it's, it's a, it's a cool lifestyle, but it's like a sucky lifestyle. The same, because like you said, like sometimes you're just in the field and you can't, like, there is no showering. Like people, like there is nothing to go shower. You know what I mean? Like you can't just take a shower when you want. You having to use baby wipes. Um, sometimes you you're wearing the same clothes for, like two two three days just depending on on how many spare uniforms you brought so you kind of have to time like Ugh. when you change uniforms or you know constantly drying your uniforms things like that or even to the extreme of like sleeping in the rain you know what i mean like on like a hard hard surface because me like guys would have tents and stuff but i didn't get issued a tent so i'm just like i'm just laying down on basically the ground and you know you're in this little wobby or uh, this little um, I forgot what they call it, but it's like a little sleep a sleeping yeah. system. Yeah. Oh, we'll and we'll be yeah, we we'll pack. And I'm just like, dude, like, what am I doing here? And I know, like, I'm I'm getting rained on, and like, if I want to, like, you know, it's just like it's just a crazy lifestyle. But then we were like you said, like, I want to take it back because, like, I think those times really bonded well, like, made me bond more with my teammates for some reason. Yeah, like we just because we 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 could relate to this um and, and in a weird way but yeah like infantry is not for everybody like if you're saying this and like you're thinking about infantry like like just like don was saying like really take a like a hard look at yourself and what like what you want out of life and if that's a lifestyle that you want to want to have <laughs> but um yeah so uh going into um uh, Mar Marsoc, you know, Marsoc selection, and then we'll get into, you know, answering the unit. Um, where did this thought or inspiration to try out for Marsoc come into play? Yeah, so I was on uh, the sniper platoon in uh, first one four, um, and I didn't get a chance to go to cyber school, so I was just trying to look for another way that I can <clears throat> sell my career. And I felt like my a lot of my skills and you know who I was could deserve to to try out and do something more or get a, at least get a chance to do something more something cool with the military. So, um there was this uh, trailer across the street from where our unit was and there was all these like cool guys walking around there with like a little bit different uniform cooler boots you know velcro on their uniform so i was like yeah i'm gonna go check this out so i don't go across the street and you know marslock was just standing up like there um when i went into that trailer it was you know late 2009 um and Marsoc stood up in like 2007 so it was like a very very new unit and they didn't I really didn't know what what it was at the time so anyways went to the trailer asked them what it was and they were like oh this is Marine Special Operations Command I'm like oh shit Special Operations let's give this a try 
So that was kind of my motivation to, to kind of do that. And one four, I did two back-to-back deployments to Iraq with them. Um, and then their next deployment was going to be on the 31st Mew, which is the Marine Expeditionary Unit. So they're just going to go float around on a ship, maybe get called for battle or whatever that was. But I'm like, dude, I just went to Iraq twice. I want to go to Afghanistan. Like, that's where I'm trying to go and try to go. So Iraq was dying down. Afghanistan was popping off at the time. So I was like trying to go back into the, to the fight. So anyways, that was my route into it. Um, so yeah, that was my mindset of getting into there. Okay. Yeah. And in terms of preparation, like what were you doing to get ready for selection? If you were even doing preparation. Yeah, I was already on the sniper platoon. So yeah, if you're not a sniper on a sniper platoon, you're a pig, right? So you're what they call, you know, professional instructor guy men or whatever it is, but you're running around everywhere with a weight in your backpack running around everywhere. So I already had the rucking abilities from that. And then just, um, you know, I already had the land nav. And so it was a, I really didn't train much more than I already was to go to selection. You know, it was just kind of a way like, all right, let's, let's give it a try and see where it can go. Um, and ended up making it on the selections. Okay. Fortunate, yeah. And looking back, is there anything you will, like, I know you're, you're pretty solid with, with preparation, but is, is there anything that you'd have done more or less of to get ready for a selection? Yeah, I mean, looking at it now, like how my body is now, of course, I would, you know, train a different way in, in a smarter and more prolonging my career and my, my body more than I was back then, right? Like back then, I was like, just, hey, run as hard as you can, as fast as you can for as long as you can, right? And that, that was the goal. Hey, if you want to throw weight on, I'll do the same thing, I'll run as fast as I can, as long as I can. But, you know, now, like the more I was into the special operations community, like the, and seeing some of the older guys still performing at the same level, but just changing their mindset on how they train and how they do that. Um, you know, like rucking and keeping the standard just by walking and not running. That's huge, right? If you're able to open up your stride, you save your knees, you save your back and all that stuff. So that I would have trained smarter in that way to protect my back and all that stuff. Um, get more time in the pool, which I had the opportunity after, but going to selection, there was some stuff in the water that I was decent at, but not like amazing at. Maybe get some more range time before going into special operations and shooting. Right in the infantry, you actually don't get to shoot that much live rounds, surprisingly or not. And you're like, you know, a war fighting uh, community and environment, but you don't get to shoot that much. So maybe take some time to go hone in my own skills before going to there. So those are some of the because shooting to the special operations standards is a lot, lot harder than just regular shooting, right? Because like, you know, you can't miss. So that was like one of the things that I would love love to work on before more often got it and at a certain point in time didn't you have to serve in the marine corps for a certain amount of time or serve a recon before actually trying out for more sock yeah i think it's the same way still that they want guys with some experience so you know Marsoc's the only unit that doesn't allow you to go straight from the streets right like the steals you can go from being a college student or you know just 18 and give it a try at street into you know who can then whatever buzz pop prep they can go straight into buzz buzz to be buzz to be a, a navy seal and the same thing for the 18 x-ray program in the special forces or rangers or whatever but mars like you actually have to serve some time in the regular marine corps before you. i think it's still the same now okay yeah and like did you like did you realize the magnitude of like what it what it, what it was that you were volunteering for at the time i did not to be honest with you yeah, I just okay. wanted to, I wanted to leave my unit, and I, I kind of got shafted. I really wanted you to be a sniper, and I thought, like, that was, like, my dream. I still never went to sniper school, even after I went to special operations. But, yeah, I, I didn't really realize it. And throughout the process, I was like, oh, man, is this something cool or something better? This is harder. This is a new challenge for me. Um, and it's a, a new way for me to learn and adapt and, and kind of grow from that. So I kind of took it for what it was. But uh, it wasn't really until, like, we got to Afghanistan that I really kind of realized like, dude, we're fucking doing some cool shit right now. You know? Um, so, yeah, it was awesome. And uh, during your during your first day of selection, like, do you recall, like, your thoughts or emotions? Like, was it kind of like, man, I'm like, I'm sure it was. Like, was it like, I'm so glad to be here? Or was it also thoughts of, like, imposter syndrome of, like, looking around at all the candidates? maybe after seeing them do PT tests or doing workouts or whatnot of like, man, like how, how am I on trans supposed to make like pass this compared to all these other guys? I mean, 
so yeah, so selections like uh, you know, they don't no one talks about it because it's supposed to be kept a secret because it's supposed to be to a certain degree like a surprise and certain things because they want to assess you the best you can not tr have someone train for individual events. Of course, you know about the rucking and the physical fitness and all that stuff. I actually did pretty decent compared to, you know, I wasn't worried too much about the physical fitness there. I, I trained up and, you know, coming from the infantry and then going into the platoon, like, you know, a lot of the things that the military is going to ask you to do, right? You got to be in shape. You got to be able to run, swim, rock, lift weights, and all that stuff. So I wasn't too surprised about uh, selection process. And dude, our selection was the most professional thing I've ever been to in the military. Like my selection process was three weeks. And, oh. Uh, very very limited interactions with like instructors and stuff like that you like you take some instructions from a whiteboard kind of thing and it was like a very professional environment and of course like you're comparing yourself to people at the right but i i was doing decent to compare it to the rest of them so i wasn't too worried about that aspect especially in selection you know you know what always boggles me is like, like um how when i think about like delta or i think about development group and I I see guys like like, like your unit like Marsoc, you know, because they're your Marsoc is tier one, right? Or is it tier? Oh. What tier is it? Um, that that's all kind of like speculative on how to, you have your, of course your tier one units, which is Debra, which you talked about, and, and uh, CAG or you know Gribber, I mean, uh, and Delta, and then yeah, uh, other soft units or white soft unit is typically what they call it in. Uh, the community, right? And that's your regular SEALs, your Green Berets, your your MARSOC, your Marine Raiders, your PJs, and your CCTs. But with all within those units, on your regular soft units, you can still get attached to do other things and, you know, take different billets and positions and stuff like that. So the, when people say the tiered level assets, it's really about, you know, where you're getting your funding from. Like, how that mm -hmm. you're getting funding for their operations. Is it coming from the DOD or is it coming from other pots of money from the U.S. government, you know, so that's how they classify, like, are you a tier one unit? But when you say tier one, tier two, tier three, like, that's not, tier one for sure, because those are the guys, I mean, you don't get higher than that, but there's other weird things without there, too, that, you know, so I mean, I guess if you were classified, I think, tier three or tier two or something like that. Um, I yeah, know. but I, I guess what I was kind of going with was, like, how... How, it's like um, how even guys like you or guys from your community still go to some to a, like Delta, like want to trial for like Delta Force, and I'm like, man, like I I think y'all guys are like on par with like Delta, but they're, they're oh. they still think there's more, and yeah. I'm just like, no, nah, there's way I don't know, it just boggles me, man. Like it's like, dude, like Delta Force development group, like these guys like level is crazy. Yeah, they are. They they definitely are, um, and uh, I've haven't had too much experience with them. Like so, like for one, when I was at, at uh, First Raider Battalion, we had an exchange program. So we had like a, a tag dude come out. He would he used to be a Marine, ra a recon guy, a Marine Raider at the time, um, before he went over there. So he came back, shared his you know training with us, and taught us up and everything like that. So that was a really cool experience of getting to meet somebody at that caliber but when i was working selection on as a cadre side you know a lot of those old cadre guys are old green beret guys or um old cad guys old you know actually it was just tag, no no still team six guys or anything like that but seeing those guys shoot seeing that how they rock and all that stuff and these guys are old like these guys are retired you know and they're still kicking your ass in some of the events so you're like holy shit like you are on a different level um yeah the yeah it's just like i said like just i can never, i always like i said i always get amazed by these guys and a lot of them come from like things where like like they'll have some will have stories of like man i wasn't the best athlete or i wasn't yeah the best athlete on the team or division one or whatever the case and next you know they're like on the top they're, they're the tip of the spear over here you know they run they they run great they run great and it's just like man like yeah, it just, yeah, it's just—it's just incredible where these, all these walks of life, where these people come from, and how how dramatically they change their life. But um, yeah, I don't know. I I, I didn't mean to go on a tantrum on a tantrum on that, but but anyways, uh, going back to selection, what did you struggle most with at selection? Yeah, so I land nav was like a completely different ball game from what I used to <laughs> did like in the infantry. So 
And the reason why is because I've always trained in Champ Pendleton, which hills and stuff like that are work with a huge issue, but like navigating all the vegetation. And then like when you look at a map, that map could have been created in the springtime and then or in the wintertime or summertime. So that the terrain looks a little bit different because you have to account for all that the trees or the greenery. Maybe a stream is there when it shouldn't be and all that stuff. So that kind of threw me off a little bit on the land nav side. I never I didn't miss any points, but it, it was a little bit more hard to navigate and I almost missed a few points moving through it. And I also sprained my ankle. So that, that was like a, a huge thing for me, like kind of navigating it and, and pushing through that. So, um, and you're out there by yourself. So you really have no one to kind of bounce ideas off of. So it's like a very super independent kind of activity that you're going to test yourself in that way. So that was interesting. Yeah. To, to that. I got you. And, um, and of course, I you know I have to mention the the water aspect of selection. How comfortable were you in the water, and like how do you remain calm? You know when you know you may have your feet or arms tied up, or you're getting smoked. You know physical training, and then you're having to do laps in the pool or events in the pool. Like kind of talk talk to us about that. Yeah. So going through selection, like I I didn't have much water training at before selection. You know it was just whatever that we did in the military for like swim calls and stuff like that, but wasn't until after um, I made it through selection that I got to work at a pool in, on, on Camp Pendleton before I went to ITC. Um, yeah, but like navigating the water, it's like, you know, people say it's the great equalizer or whatever that is. Um, and um, yeah, it, it could be different. It, it just changes and it puts you in a different, completely different mental aspect of like how comfortable you are with yourself and how you do that when you take your breath away. And that was a huge thing. And we saw that like the biggest thing that people dropped out for was the water. The first day in the pool in ITC, I think we dropped like 12 or 13 people like in the first hour and people are already quitting. I was like, holy shit, dude, this is real. But um, the ability to kind of keep yourself calm and stay relaxed, especially in the water can help directly translate to how you deal with stress outside. Right. Cause that's like the ultimate stressor of like you fearing that you're going to drown or whatever that is and, and freaking out. But if you're able to control it in the water outside, it's going to be, you know, directly translatable. Okay. Did you ever have a moment like where you were getting air hungry and you almost felt that and you somehow like calmed yourself down? Dude, yeah, all the time. Yeah, even now, at every, you know, because right now we run a company called Deep Event Fitness. And even now, like whenever we're training at the pools, that's what we strive for, right? We try to get to people to that point uh, and then have them navigate through that stressful piece. And that's how we kind of yeah. build resilience off of that. So it's, yeah, we, we try to do that all the time. And in the military, I really didn't know how to deal with it in the beginning before I went to work at the pool. But even when I went to like my water spot with a short course and all that stuff, like, dude, that I didn't shower every day after the pool because I was so sick of it, of being in the water and in that environment and, and all that stuff uh, during that time. So, um, yeah, definitely been there before and still, and still do. And uh, I know I know you have to go, so I'll just kind of cap it off, and then hopefully we get you back on here for for a part two. Okay. Uh, what advice can you give to future attendees um, who want to go to maybe not even just like not just Marsog, but want to go to recon selection? Um, what advice can you give uh, to them, <clears throat> whether it's preparation, how to be comfortable and, and calm underwater, especially with you know running deep in fitness? You know, you, I'm sure y'all have a lot of strategies and techniques to stay calm, whether it's breathing techniques or visualization whatever the case may be uh what advice can you give to future attendees yeah i mean for any military aspect or anything and you know anything that you want to do that you know it's going to be challenging and you're going to have to put yourself out there like number one is like to understand your why like what's the reason that you want to do something right and you have to know that deep down inside of your heart of your mind your soul your spirit that this is what you want to do and, and why because when times get tough, when like you were saying earlier, like when you get wet, when you get cold, you're gonna start questioning like the situation yeah. that you put yourself in. Like, hey, man, wait, do I really want to do this right now? It's pretty cold right now, or like I'm pretty tired, or whatever that is, and kind of have to navigate that and and push yourself through that um, the uncomfortableness of it. So understanding your why is like the key part of thing. And then what you brought up earlier is like that visualization, like, hey. Do I see myself being able to accomplish this, right? Can I get over the self-doubt? Can I get over the imposter syndrome and kind of just like, hey, put one foot in front of the other, visualize how I'm going to do that, and then like, hey, know that there is a light at the end of the tunnel, that kind of piece on it. So, um, yeah, 
going into it, I was saying why then visual edition is huge, but last thing I'll, I'll, I'll kind of leave with is like, we use breath work in deep end fitness and in the military and all that stuff as like a remote control for our nervous system. Right. So of course we can tap into the parasympathetic side, which is like rest and digest, or we can tap into the sympathetic side, which is the fire or flight, right? So fire or flight, we're kind of stressed out. We're kind of anxious. Like we don't really know what's going on or we're hyper-focused onto one thing and kind of have tunnel vision. So finding that balance in between those two nervous systems and down regulating and calming yourself down to be able to better make better decisions is the key purpose of breath work. And for me, just elongating those exhales, and whenever I'm in a stressful situation, it's taking a deep breath in and then blowing that air out nice and slow and easy. And then just repeat that a few times. Yeah, if you can take anything more than that, um, that would be key. Got it, man. Cool. Well, hey, Don, man, I really appreciate your, your uh, time, man. Like I said, only we can uh, figure out uh, how we can get you on here for a part two so we can kind of go on the tail end of, of everything with arriving at the unit, deep in fitness and whatnot. But uh, once again, man, I, I really appreciate you just taking the time that you do have to come on here and uh, talk to me and, you know, sh share uh, a little bit about your story to the audience. So yeah, I just, just really want to say thank you, man. Yeah. But uh, hey, uh, but that's it, guys, man. I uh, appreciate y'all for who tune in and who support me. And, uh, you know, I just I just ask y'all continue to, you know, share these stories so that way they can be shared and and seen by the world. Um, really hope that you know it'll it'll impact somebody out there uh but with that that's it guys and uh hopefully we'll see you for part two Stay tuned.